So since the last time we had you here, which was in July, we've had uh, World War Three in January and now coronavirus in mm-hmm. February. Uh, how have you survived so so far this 2020 season? Well, I think in those terms, I have to, if you're talking about kind of current current affairs and world events and all of that kind of thing, I cross, um, or rather I walk a kind of fine line between thinking, ought I to keep well informed or mm-hmm. ought I to never listen to radio for again? <laughs> um <laughs> Because it's just, um, I think it can be kind of overwhelming. And well, the, so the is, cure for coronavirus is to turn off the TV. Yeah, I think it's um, it's 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 killing me to kind of to 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 hear about it and to deal with no toilet paper in the supermarkets and stuff like that. So yeah, isn't there like an <laughs> NHS suggest? I oh, know is it America? It might be an H- it might be England. It might be America. They're suggesting that you have two weeks worth of canned food like ready. It's like, so, Jesus Christ, let's just calm it down. I know. Eating tin food is just depressing anyway, to be honest. <laughs> so, um, but no, in the, I mean, the last, I've had a, I've had a good last few months. It's been, um, it's been a kind of busy time. I've, um, yeah, we need to talk about Vermont. Yes. So what have you been doing in Vermont? Well, that was, um, that was a, that was a wedding. Mm-hmm. So I, um, so I photographed the wedding for a young couple, early twenties, Groom is British, um, who I've known for several years, and his bride is uh, is is American from uh, from one of the southern states of America, and so they use Vermont as a kind of destination um, wedding, and I you know I felt very very lucky to to be asked to do it. Yeah, for for obvious reasons, it was um it it was a a really fun gig. Any sort of did you have any nerves going in because obviously. Different country, different customs, different setup. Um, I was slightly apprehensive. I, I mean, I'd had good good communication with the kind of wedding coordinator that they use, and so that was nice from the point of view of um, the 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 work side of things. Um, and the ceremony itself is uh, it was it was like a sort of twenty five minute ceremony. So I don't know whether that uh, is kind of typical of American weddings, but all of the uh, all of that side of things was was much shorter and the the stuff with with a with a kind of UK wedding you've got uh you know a well-worn structure you've got the entrance of the bride you've got the bridesmaids you've got the signing of the register and all of that kind of thing but with this one it was um there wasn't a kind of structure right per se it was just shoot the ceremony it was it was pretty casual um in terms of the going into the states that's always dramatic i mean i hadn't been to the states since 2005 um and so i had um i had the usual immigration d- double check i uh, i uh, at both ends um that's not, not the way to phrase that no <laughs> <laughs> i mean in both uh, in both nations being a single man traveling with um with machinery so i got the full pat down and the swab testing and yeah why yeah, all of that stuff um i've only dodged it once and it was on the way to vegas last november right where i definitely thought i was going to get checked a single not obviously not single but a, a lone guy traveling to vegas in like an off week vegas obviously having the recent history that it has yeah but as i was going through customs in england there was a group of women that were trying to sneak something through between their legs and there was this big customs panic to hold them back so i just got through really easily all the guys were just going straight through which was great nice and then coming back they don't americans don't care if you're leaving if you're leaving your father you're not their problem anymore yeah no exactly i mean it it, it was a su- successful trip and incredible because it was snowing there as well the the landscape and the, the whole setting was amazing but i had a um a really interesting personal uh thing happen there and it was um when i was when i was at school i had a i went i went to school in a town where there was a a huge american air force base and i had a friend whose dad was in the air force who was stationed um in the uk for i think it must have been four or five years and so he came to my school uh for four of those years and then when he was 13 he returned to the us and you know i never kind of heard from him again and, and that was fine and a year or two ago i um found him on Facebook and we kind of reestablished contact and he, um, you know, he'd had a kind of interesting career in the 
US Coast Guard and now runs his own kind of car business and that sort of thing. And um, I knew that he was in, I couldn't remember where where in the US he was based, but I, th- it, I thought it was the kind of Massachusetts, New Hampshire kind of area. And so when I knew that I was doing this wedding, um, I told him the town uh, where I was going to be working for a few days. And he, and he said, oh my goodness, that's the town where I work. Oh, and wow. And so it was, that was an incredible coincidence. And so I saw him, you know, we had a really nice lunch and we worked out that it was 32 years since the last time we'd seen each other. And Do you the, know how terrifying that is? I'm 31. Yeah. So it was a, it was a, it was a, it was a very long time. Wow. And um, yeah, a staggering coincidence where, I mean, you know. Small I, world, right? Everyone's going to say that when you tell that story. No, but I know. Small world. And, I, and I just assumed I'd never see him again. And obviously for his, you know, w- with families like that, that do, that have overseas postings, it's a fleeting thing. And having, you know, having worked overseas myself, you kind of make these, temporary friends that sometimes you, you know, sometimes you stay in contact with, but most often everybody accepts that you're going to go on and do your next thing and they'll, they'll go on and do their next thing as well. And you'll probably never either see or hear from them again. Yeah. So it was, uh, it was a remarkable coincidence. Really nice. Yeah. Um, so you said snow. Yes, indeed. And uh, you told me last week the temperature, which was what, like minus. So it was in the, it was in the minus twenties in obviously Yikes. in Celsius. So it was, it was freezing. In, in proper way of measuring temperature. Yeah, exactly. In Celsius. So it was, um, yeah, the cold was, was extraordinary, very cold and dry. So it, it kind of hurt your throat basically. And so, um, yeah, I mean, that is what it is. We did, we did all of the, the kind of formal shots outside cause the couple wanted the, 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 the snowy backdrop and everything else. And so we had, um, I mean, it was, it was really nice actually. I managed to, to, to have an assistant or two. And so we had blankets that the, the venue had supplied. Yeah. You said about, you had a guest that was like yeah I had holding a, down, holding down your gear for you. Yeah. And- I had a super, super keen guy who had, um, he'd assisted somebody on a, on a previous wedding. He was holding reflectors and, you know, switching camera bodies around and all this kind of thing. So when I said I needed somebody or not needed, but well, yes, needed basically. Yeah. Um, he was at the front of the queue nice. and it was amazing. So he was because of the, it was a kind of three o'clock wedding. The, you know, it was a cloudless, cloudless, sunny day with all the snow everywhere. So there was, you know, light absolutely everywhere. And so he was holding the scrim, which was um, super helpful. And the, you know, the pictures look absolutely beautiful. And I think with, you know, low, uh, if you shoot somebody's wedding in a village hall and they want um, they want a hello spread, that's going to be difficult. But if you're, yeah. you know, in an amazing location, it's yeah, it's, 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 hard it's something to make I've a never mess. managed to kind of um, find a way to approach. I have I have the issue of being uh, far too sterile with the truth, <laughs> and I think sometimes you need to muddy it up a bit depending on your audience. Yeah. And there are weddings you do where you you almost want to sort of show them what they've chosen, yeah, and then what their expectations are, exactly, and then ask them to show you the correlation. Mm. Because I've had this year, I've had um, you know weddings in torrential rain, and I got set on fire at a wedding a short while back, lost part of my finger, which was fun, and. All, all of these crazy things, you know, the the insistence on doing stuff that just the weather or the location doesn't suit. Yeah. Um, I'm actually um, trying to find a way to approach venues that I go to regularly and just ask them to sort certain things out mm. without seeming like a diva. Yeah. Um, but there's there's a venue down the road from here that I've, I've done a wedding at in the last few months. And when we went there at the end of last year, they had scaffolding that had fallen over just left outside of a ceremony. And then this year we go back scaffolding still now with moss growing over it, just left outside of a ceremony. And it's like, well, that's sh- it's shocking for all kinds of reasons. I mean, that the most obvious one is the kind of practical, you know, the health and safety yeah. thing, the first thing, but also if you, you know, the kind of money that venues charge people yeah. to, to get married there, part of that sh- surely is would pay op- someone minimum wage for an hour to go and move the scaffolding yeah or yeah. just the or just think about the aesthetics you know people yeah. people uh, you know they pay good money for wedding photographers and they want the pictures to look good and it's it's bizarre because it would surely be like a a a continuation of 
you know, your investment would would flow into more bookings because mm. the pictures coming out would be better and and so on. Yeah, exactly. That side of things I find very bizarre. How many weddings are you shooting a year at the moment? Oh, not many. So I have about of my own, maybe six or eight of my own. But I um, but I do second shooting as well. Yeah. For um, for a, a really lovely wedding photographer called Nikki Kirk, who um, is uh, that's her that's her main gig, and I love doing that. Yeah, and she always shoots in lovely places with with lovely couples. So, how much does your your portrait work marry up to your excuse the pun, but marry up to your wedding work? Is I there see. is there a stylistic through line, or are you a different? Mm, I see what you did there with the pun. I didn't mean um, to. And I'm really <laughs> proud of myself. <laughs> no, I think um, I think with with all of the all of the work I do, regardless of whether it's you know studio portraits or whatever else. I'm quite a firm believer in um, working on the conservative with a small C side of things because I think it doesn't date. Yeah, and I and I think if uh, you know certainly with the studio portrait work, I'm very open about the fact that I take my inspiration from you know historical portraiture and all of that kind of thing, and you know fine artwork and that um, that type of stuff because it doesn't really go out of style. And I think if you that you know there's nothing wrong with doing stuff which is flighty or fashionable, absolutely not. But I um, I think with wedding photography, I definitely always err on the on the the uh, the should we say the classic okay. side of things? Yeah, because just because I don't want I, I, you know I don't want people to have the pictures and in five years it looks dated or or if I've done color work which is fashionable right now in the wedding yeah. magazines and it, you know it's it's going to look yeah there's a old. pretty extreme like uh, green to brown thing going on right yeah, now exactly um, <clears throat> which I think in a in a you know in about five six years it's going to be a lot of conversations of, well, that's just what looked good at the time, dear. Yeah, exactly. I mean, the other talk, while we're talking about fashions in kind of color grading and we're heading down the super nerdy, yes, uh, super nerdy route, um, the, my, my absolute favorite way of wedding color grading or wedding photography is, is people that shoot medium format film on Fuji 400 H and really overexpose it. So that's, that's a thing I think, especially in America where, you know, sunny Californian weddings. It looks lovely like that. And I'm sure that is a fad as well, but I really, I really love well, that. Well, it's a long lasting fad if it's yeah. coming off the back of, you know, overexposed film. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I think that is also geographically relevant where it's being done, because I think mm. if you're in Chiswick, you're probably not going to get the same uh, light quality <laughs> as maybe yeah, you're getting in California for 300 days of the year. No, exactly. Exactly. But that's my, if I if I had the, the uh, if I had the option of about how all my wedding pictures would look, it would be like yeah, two stops over. Do you have do you have the urge at all to shoot film? Yeah, well, I do shoot some film, but only as a I, only as a hobby, really. I mean, um, I've got a, a Mamiya C thirty three, which um, uh, which I'm just you know using to shoot for fun, and uh, a Canon A one, and I've got um, one or two other Canon film SLRs. Uh, but, I mean, nothing for work, really. I mean, I've never shot film in the studio, which is yeah, kind I, of embarrassing. Yeah, it's kind of surprising because it feels like it would be perfect for it. Yeah. Um, um, but we do have to talk about something because the last time you were on, you talked about your 5D Mark III and your 5D Classic. Mm. Obviously, uh, the last couple of podcasts I've had, especially the previous one to this, I moaned quite incessantly about my wife forcing me to switch for the second time in six months from Fuji now over to Sony, you've switched. Yeah. So do you want to take me through what you've, what you've done? Yeah. So I've, I, I, I've switched quite significantly actually to, um, to a Fuji medium format camera. So a GFX 50 S and I've kind of paired that with, um, an X pro one as my kind of fun camera. Which I'm u- which I'm just using as like a an iPhone substitute really, and so the um, the reason I got the GFX is I mean there are two reasons basically the practical reason is that my um, my lovely old mum died a couple of years ago and I inherited a little bit of money, and so I used um, you know I used the money to to buy the camera effectively, and um, I think if I hadn't if I hadn't have had 
uh, you know, a little bit of spare going. It's not something probably that I would have uh, saved to buy because I don't even know. It's the kind of um, device I I have no idea whether whether it will earn its keep at all. I mean, right. there's absolutely no question about the way the the photos look. I mean, the photos look absolutely uh, jaw dropping. Um, but I think with um, certainly with clients, they I don't know who can tell the difference or not. Um, but the, uh, it, it certainly moved the work along a lot in, you know, without having to kind of do anything. I mm-hmm. mean, the, 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 the difference in the way the pictures look is, uh, is phenomenal. I mean, I'm not, you know, I'm not a massive gear head, you know, you can do great work with, with pretty much anything. And I, you know, I still love shooting with the 5d classic, you know, it's still an amazing camera, but we, uh, with the, um, the GFX, it's, um, I was I, when I was on my way here. I knew you'd ask me about it, and I knew I'd have to try and find some um, uh, some kind of intelligent way to articulate what the what the difference is. Yeah, and I think it's um, the the most obvious thing is the way that it reproduces color, which is um, I don't even know whether I'd say it was more lifelike or not. I I don't even know whether that's relevant or even a thing. I don't know whether it's more lifelike. It's certainly better subjectively. Yep. I th- you know, I can look at two things and I did, you know, the, the, the way that I first became, um, aware of this camera was that I had one on a kind of short loan and I shot some images of somebody with it and, you know, some other images in the same set with the 5D Mark III. And if you put the two side by side, the difference is night and day in terms of the, I mean, the most obvious thing is obviously the resolution you can zoom in for, you know, miles and miles and miles. But the the way that people's skin looks, the way that fabric drapes, the way, um, he, and again, I may well be into the realms of like fairy tale or just utter subjectivity, but the way that light looks overall, yeah. it all seems, I don't even know how you describe the difference because, you know, on the one hand, you'll, you'll have people saying, oh, well, light is light and so on, which of course it, it, it definitely is. Mm. But um well, paint is paint, but I think in, yeah. in different formats, you know, there's a bit of a difference between buying like Wilkinson's home brand wall paint and then getting an oil paint that's, you know, really been crafted. Yeah. And- um, I, I mean, I, I it's very difficult, you know, without sort of seeing the pictures, without just looking at the pictures. I mean, obviously that's the best way to to kind of judge that. But there is a, there's a kind of very significant difference. And it's all, I think the whole... Um, experience of using the camera is, you know, whenever, if you watch a YouTube video where somebody's talking about a medium format camera, whether it's a Hasselblad or, you know, whatever it might be, they say the same old things. They're big and heavy. Um, they slow you down. And all of that is true, of course. Um, and the, you know, everybody will say uh, slowing down is is the point, mm. which I completely agree with. And it does change change the way you work. I mean, I've never been an overshooter anyway. When I when I get the pictures that I want, I don't shoot another 50 just to be sure. Um and with the with the GFX, everything about it is slow. The autofocus is slow. I, I I don't think by other medium format standards it's particularly slow. It's probably about the same, I would say. Um but the even when the shutter clicks when you press the button it feels slower it's almost i mean obviously the shutter is moving at the speed that it moves at but it kind of feels you know clunk click yeah that that type of thing um you know just the whole thing is slow and it does you do kind of think um you know i'm slowing down i'm thinking about the picture that i'm taking i'm making sure that the compositional elements in the in the photo are right and all of that kind of good stuff um you know it slows you down for a good reason um I mean, all of the kind of, I was going to say not negative, but things like, you know, the enormous file sizes do, you know, uh, they slow the computer down. The, my storage is hitting the buffers big time. Yeah. Um, I mean, with it, I, with, with the kind of studio portrait shoots that I do, if I take like 200 shots, um, you know, it's like 20 gigs or something of raw files. It's insane where, yeah. where it would have been five gigs. Yeah, on the um on the five D Mark III or something, but it's um, you know, it's a stunning camera. I wouldn't dare shoot a wedding on it or anything, obviously. Right. Um, just because of the slowness. 
I think so. Yeah. I mean, if I, I'd, I'd certainly shoot portraits on it, but it's, um, you go for the first kiss and yeah, dung, dung. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And, <laughs> and the, really you know, happens. the bridal prep and stuff like that. But I haven't, I mean, I haven't, uh, I've only had it for, you know, for two or three months. It is definitely Fuji's least inconspicuous camera. Yeah. It's, it's a monster. very there. Yeah. It's very yeah. ugly as well. And I, um, I do like, I do like the way things look. Not, yeah. um, not enough for, you know, I wouldn't buy a camera just because it looked nice. But it's definitely a kind of plus point. Yeah. And with this one, it's um, it's kind of utilitarian. It looks like um, it looks like it's twenty years old. Yeah. Um, and it's uh, it's got uh, a bit of a Soviet thing going on. Yeah, and I can and you can I can dig that because it wears its ugliness kind of on its sleeve. Yeah. Well, yeah. I I I mean, obviously, I used it for a short while, and I found I, I liked a few things. I really liked on the battery grip, like the shutter button isn't on the sort of if you if you tilt the camera it's not on the top there's almost like a little recess mm. for the shutter button sitting. Yeah. i really like that because it did feel like as i turned it the first time i was like christ that's going to be a stretch mm. but it's not it's tucked in really nicely um viewfinder's really nice mm. it's got near identical setup to other fuji's more recent ones so menu system because i've already used it was really straightforward and um i, I really like the operation of it i do think it's a camera that you're not going to pick up um, because of how it looks at you on the table. No. It's one that you're going to pick up because you're excited about the files that are going to come out of it. Yeah, and it does. I mean, the, the, the first shoot that I did with it was, um, it was a test shoot with a, with a professional model. And literally the first frame that I took with it was, um, it was absolutely breathtaking. I, I could not believe. I mean, it was a, it was a, um, like a vintage uh, kind of pinup type shoot with um with a 50s uh, like a satin 50s ball dress you know so everything in the shoot had been very carefully set up it wasn't you know it had been done properly because i wanted to see you know what this thing could do and when the first picture came through to to the computer i you know i was absolutely uh astonished i think is probably the best way to put it the um and it's, you know, I feel sort of moderately embarrassed talking in these terms because I've, you know, always um, had some pride in the fact that I don't, uh, I don't get a thing for gear. Yeah. You know, I like, you know, if something produces good work or if it can help me produce good work, that's fine. But it's slightly different with this because um, it is. Do you think if, what I noticed when I watched you shoot with that is, um, you don't see this very often, and I I know the feeling, but I don't see it very often, but it did seem like you really lean in on it. You really, like when you're shooting, you really are enjoying every photo that you're taking. It didn't feel like you would take a picture and look at the back of the camera like you would check the oven to see if the thing that's in it is done. Yeah, You were really looking at the back of the camera. You were really looking at the, the sorry, the tethering. Mm. Um, but you were really looking at what you were doing. Like you, you really felt like every shot was, was important. Yeah, I think that's true. I mean, part of it, to be honest with you, is the novelty of like, oh my goodness, how ridiculous does this file look? Yeah. And so there's part of that. Yeah. It, uh, I, I mean, it's all, it's all part of slowing down, I think, and just checking. I mean, I check carefully anyway, so that I don't overshoot. Um just want to make sure that everything is as good as I can get it. I mean, if you, there's nothing, you know, everybody knows this, there's, there's nothing worse than shooting and then coming to the edit and thinking, you know, I can fix it in the, yeah. in post and actually you're going to make a, a half ass job of it. I mean, I hate that. Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, it, yeah, checking carefully, enjoying the way the the pictures look and just, and just slowing down really. Cause I think, overshooting is tiring for everybody. It's tiring for you. It's boring for you. It's very tiring if you're shooting portraits and making your, your model or your portrait subject work harder than they need to. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's, it's it, I think if you're shooting multiple sets and you overshoot on the first one, you're damaging the future sets as yeah. much as anything, because you just start to bring in a fatigue yeah. to the way that, that you're working and, I think as well, there are, there are certain models, I think, try and learn your pattern mm. of what you're looking for. And 
yeah, that fatigue and that sort of almost, I don't want to say annoyance, but I can't really, that sort of the tedium of it, especially for more experienced models, can it can be. Like I've had, I've had days where I'm not really feeling it. It's not mm. really going right from my end. And I've realized that I'm basically punishing a model <laughs> by like just trying to, to make it work. And I'm just cycling and cycling and cycling and just overshooting. And at the end of it, I've just got lots of something that I don't want as opposed yeah. to a few. Yeah. Um, I think that, I mean, I think what you, what, what you said is very true and it's, um, a kind of good side point to that is one thing that I that I try to do in shoots. I don't always do it, but if I think about it, it's actually taking stock of what you've got in a set and thinking if it's not going okay, what do I need to do, you know, to make it okay? Is it a technical problem? Is it a problem with the lights? Is it a you know, or or, or some other aspect of the um, of the shoot? But it's just I think. Um, I think it's easy to kind of take the pictures in the session and hope it's going to be okay when you get to the edit or, you know, whatever it might be. And then, um, you know, if you can, if you can think and take stock and, you know, just work out what's happening, that's, that's good. And I think if you, you know, I get to work with an assistant at times and if you've got somebody as well as checking the stuff like, you know, if you, is it consistently in focus on all that, all the basic stuff, but somebody who um, whose eye you can trust, who can let you know, you know, just be be a second pair of eyes in that in that sort of high pressure. Not, I don't know whether you call it a shoot high pressure eye situation. Well, I think you can get you can get a bit of tunnel vision where yeah. you're. <clears throat> I mean, if you're focusing on like, I, I've had it in the past. We had the Sony A seven R three. And previous to that, I had the uh, 5DS, which were both very high megapixel. And mm. you can get very caught up in what the resolution is doing yeah. and how much you're getting out of the resolution mm. and be almost, as a photographer, almost a little bit too blinded to just focus on that. And there will be little things throughout the photo that with a slight change of like hand position, I know we talked about that last time ad nauseum, but um, like slight changes to the posing or even just like a slight distraction within the image, having that second set of eyes. I often, cause I don't shoot with an assistant um, cause I'm terribly bad at dealing with people. Uh, I often actually just get the the model or the, the actor or whoever to kind of look through and see what they think and just hear from someone who's not normally on that side of a camera. Yeah. One, I mean, one thing that I've picked up talking about, you know, second pairs of eyes, if for, for some of the shoots that I do, or if it's a, if it's a job, um, if you have hair and makeup artists that you work with, yeah. they have, tr they are tremendous. Second Great eye for detail. Yeah. They're like human macro lenses. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And it's, um, I mean, obviously when, when they're on set and you're shooting, um, you know, a lot of what they're doing is making sure hairs aren't out of place or if they're, you know, if they're clothing labels or that, you know, that type of thing. But very often they, you know, if you ask for their advice, um, on the way the shoot's looking, on the way the set's progressing, they they give great advice. Yeah, um, yeah, no, absolutely. And and as far as keeping an eye on like little incidental details, I don't think that there's anyone else you could have on set that would mm, be better. Yeah. I do have to ask a question: having now watched you shoot and see, having seen your studio and your setup and whatnot, I don't know if you do, but it definitely doesn't appear to me that you do. Um, you seem to have the perfect set up in terms of the studio and in the way that you work and, and in the consistency of your work that you could be doing a lot of like zines or editorials, mm. but you do a lot of standalone stuff that works within a greater portfolio. Yeah. I feel like you could do like editorials. I would love to do editorials. Uh, what's, um, but you could easily be doing it now with, with what you've got set up. What's holding you back? Well, that's a good question. Not um, to sound like your dad or anything. <laughs> Well, it's, um, I mean, to, to, to be perfectly honest with you and to be completely practical, do it in the kind of job sense. I mean, shooting editorials is, um, is, is basically a very, very low paid. It's, it's the highest creativity in photography, probably with, yep. the, with the worst financial outcome, yep. given that it's, um, you know, you have to do it in teams and, um, you know, I would like to do more of that kind of thing. And if anybody, you know, from magazine work came i mean magazine work does not come along you have to go and get it of course yeah. but um no i would certainly love to do that and i you know it, it definitely is on my kind of radar to get on with that and but it yeah i mean it's i'm you know i'm just basically being crap and should and should be doing it well i'd love to just see 
<clears throat> this is just selfishness here, but from from a, from a fan's perspective of your work, I would love to see you take a really restricted challenge and make an editorial out of it. So literally take one color or take one period of time or something and just mm. work with one with one model the way you're already working but to just build a set an editorial yeah. set out of a very restricted kind of setup because i just think with, with it's kind of like when you have you're kind of like a film director that i really like and i mean i want to throw different genres at you <laughs> and almost see what you do with them or um have you work i like there's there's people that i would be more excited to see you work with than me work with does well, that make sense? Yeah. But that's just like the, the, I'm a big fan of photography. I, mm. I don't I don't seem to find many people anymore that are. A lot of photographers don't seem to be fans of photography. They yeah. seem to be fans of doing photography. Sure. Um, but I would love to see you do, I, I mean, I'd love to like set you a challenge and just see what you did <laughs> with it. I know that that's completely impractical, but just to see you kind of work restricted. Yeah. I think you're the kind of person that would, would find a really interesting way out of the restriction. No, oh, well, thank you, first of all. I mean, I, yeah, I mean, I do, with, with, the, with the stuff that I do day to day, I I do tend to try and, I mean, you have to have boundaries with what you're doing, kind of creative boundaries so that stuff actually works. And I tend to, um, I would say that I tend to, the first big restriction, if you can call it that, that I place on myself is colour. Yeah. And so, so I do, I very often work with just one color. I mean, I love doing that. Um, or yeah, I mean, you know, to use a word you hate vibe. Um, <laughs> it was the vibe. I do. I mean, I, yeah, I know, one thing I noticed, um, so to bury the lead, I attended one of your workshops last week in case anyone doesn't know that there's a, a blog on my website, uh, chriscarl.com forward slash blog, where I talk about that experience. Um, but yeah, you brought up the word vibe, I think a record number of times. I, it felt like just to punish me. Yeah. Yeah. It was, it was heinous is the yeah. word I would use. <laughs> the word vibe absolutely grates me. No, that's fair enough. I don't use it that often. I don't know. No, no I, I, I could tell because what you were doing every time you wanted to use the word, you would pause and then look at me and then say it. So it was like. You wanted to see how much it was damaging me as you did Because I'm an it. idiot, basically. No, it was it was it was funny, and it definitely broke up some of the flow of the day. Um, but sorry, you were saying like the, the color or the vibe or yeah. Well, I think I mean I think it is color to be honest. I um, I mean one thing that I'm doing a lot is shooting white on white. Now, not um, you know, not uh, if I can say venture style white on white. I, you know, I don't want to slag off anybody that's doing that's doing anything but just um not the picture that you get in the frame already when you buy a frame from asda yeah not that not, kind of white not white. That. um and just i mean i it, it seems to work well for absolutely everybody um and you know it, it's a it's a you know you can layer different kind of whites and creams and that type of thing and it um i don't know it's just it's subjectively personally something that i that i enjoy but also um I mean, single hue dominance, as somebody uh, coined the phrase. I mean, I love just having one, one main color in the photos, um, and I don't know whether that's something I would always love, or whether people, um, whether it comes across as being slightly boring or unimaginative. But it's um, yeah, kind of minimalism that you know you you, you have your boundary, and you know what, I guess whether people like that or not is another is another question. But I love I love to do that. Well, from a photographic point of view, I think that the the quickest way to improve and to sort of fine tune something is to is just massive restriction. Mm. If you just like, there are very obvious patterns I see from teaching workshops, from watching other photographers work, that the more gear that is brought along, generally the less direction there is mm. for that person. They've got no sense of really what direction they want to go in or, you know, it's like change a lens, something magical happen mm. and it just doesn't work that way. I think if you, I think you, you said you've only got one lens for the, for the Fuji. Yeah. I can only afford one lens for well, it to be honest. Let's just pretend it was a, 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 oh, it, was a it was a creative a decision. Creative though. Choice, yeah. Um, but I, th I think that helps. I think if you learn that lens, if you learn the character of a lens, you can get absolutely every drop out of it. Yeah. I, I had my first real camera was the 5D Mark II. And I went on a used um, website and bought 135mm L. 
That's a great lens. Did not come off my camera. In fact, it's in the cupboard over there. It's in pe- It's like barely held together. Mm. It's it fell down. Um, it's fallen down a mountain. It fell down a hill in Richmond. It's been underwater. It's been beaten to death. But um, I know everything you can do with that lens. I know exactly how far away I have to stand to get a headshot that I like, the exact way that I like it. Mm. I know how to get that sort of three-quarter crop that I really like at what shooting height. I know when I can push the aperture a little bit more and how that's going to work. I know the spherical aberration. I know where the chromatic... Like, I know that lens Mm. better than I know myself. And it means that I'm not thinking about gear when I'm shooting with it. Yeah. And I just think one thing I do see a lot with uh, photography, especially because we live in like, um, in a capitalistic sense, we live in the best time ever to be a a photographer because it's the cheapest time to get involved with it. And there is just a ridiculous array of things that you can buy to like, you know, paper over the cracks in most cases that people are doing themselves a disservice by spending their money on gear when they should just, spend their attention on learning the gear that they've got. Yeah, I agree. I mean, I, I think with w- restrictions with equipment, I mean, I mean, obviously everybody has the practical restrictions of, um, you know, what they can afford essentially. But I think in, in my case, the, certainly with the studio photography, the, uh, even before I got the, uh, the GFX system, um, and I was shooting with the, uh, with the 5D Mark three, um, you know, I've got a few lenses for the for, for the Canon system, but the one that was on there all the time is the is a fifty millimeter lens, and that's partly um, because of the size of my studio. So I like to shoot full length almost as a kind of default, and I have to, um, you know, I have to not be lazy and shoot other crops as well as um, as well as full length. But my because my studio is so small, fifty is the is the longest focal length I can have on there and still fit a full length portrait in. Yep. So, um, you know, being purely practical, um, but you do, you know, you do learn the, 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 the quirks of, of a lens and the, you know, the sweet spot and all of that kind of thing. And so I think with, you know, I mean, many of the, the kind of historical greats in photography, they, they shot with really, you know, really simple equipment, one, one body, one lens, yep. you know, all, all kinds of people, Cartier Bresson, um, you know, Richard Avedon, all, all kinds of like legends are, were shooting on equipment, which by modern standards is, you know, very straightforward indeed. Yeah. And it's, um, and it's not, you know, it's not about the gear. I, you know, I mean, I know you know this already and I know everybody listening to it knows this already. I think it's, um, I think it's, it's the one thing I would say with like the, it's not about the gear thing is that, there are people that absolutely think it's about the gear that will say it's not about the gear. Yeah. Okay. You know, there are, there, there's a significant portion of people that I've met that will downplay what the, they think, or they'll downplay their importance of gear, but it's not true. Yeah. Um, and you know, the set, <clears throat> one thing I will say is when I switched to Fuji back last year, I, I went to a couple of like Facebook groups, a couple of Instagram hashtags to follow to just see what work was being produced by it. Cause I think that's one of the ways you can learn tricks with, you know, tricks with the gear. Sure. And how did you, you know, like one thing with the Fuji is the 16 mil 1.4 is easily the best lens they've got. And it's damn close to being a macro lens. It's got such a near focusing distance. So I went from. Uh, having to have like a hundred mil macro when I was Canon to using what is the equivalent of a 24 mil as a macro and found a new way to shoot. And I learned that through these groups. What I noticed is that there are a lot of people that the second that there is a rumor about a new piece of gear or there's an announcement instantly, the old gear is absolute shit can never work. It never did work. It's awful. And the new piece of gear is the salvation of their entire photographic career Yeah, until the next thing's announced. And then sure. the cycle repeats. And they're the same people that will constantly say that the gear doesn't matter. No, that's, that, that's fair enough. I mean, but if I can elevate myself yeah. above all of that, um, I mean, Lewis Hamilton's a very good driver, but I imagine if you put him in like a Cinquecento, he's not going to win a Formula One race. No, I mean, I, I I love equipment as much as the the next person. But I get, but I guess what 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 we're really saying really saying is that you can take excellent photographs without having amazing gear. I mean, obviously, um, a better gear does give you better technical um, a better technical outcome, but I uh, and and it can um, it can improve. 
I think it definitely does improve the experience of taking photos. Yes. And I think that, um, you, you know, if you, if you measure the outcome of, a you know, a, a Canon one DX against a Nikon, you know, D four or D five or whatever their top of the range one is, the pictures are going to look absolutely the same. Um, and you, and you will find that across the ranges of any, you know, any, any, uh, any manufacturer that makes cameras, but it, if it, um, I think if a particular kind of camera changes the way you feel about taking photos and, um, enhances your enjoyment of it, then that's, that's what it's all about, isn't it? Yeah. Um, and I think if you, you know, if you enjoy the equipment you're working with, you know, you're probably going to take nicer pictures. Yeah. Or, I mean, back, or- back when I was playing guitar and I used to do a little bit of guitar teaching and I would talk to mums of the person I'm teaching and, you know, they would ask what guitar is the right one to get. And I, I would always say, let him look, let them look like get a visual because even now, if I don't like the look of a guitar, I'm probably not going to pick it up on a day to day. So it might not be the most important factor, but when someone is like developing, having that desire to want to pick the thing up is important. And then yeah. you develop, um, like beyond the aesthetic. So I had, a, I had a, a Les Paul going back a long time and this is, I almost want to put violin underneath this cause I miss, <laughs> it's called Annie. It was, um, absolutely revoltingly ugly cause I'd set it on fire, um, a couple of times because, um, I found out that Gibson used a clear coat that was flammable and I didn't believe it. And I was of the age where I thought, okay, I'll just see if that is. And, ended up with this white Les Paul that had had huge burn marks out of it, where I had a few people tell me it kind of looked a bit like a cow okay. um, and things like, so it wasn't the most aesthetically pleasing to other people, but I could feel what that felt like to play. I could feel it right now. Yeah. What it felt like to play. So every time it, it had that thing where I, every mm. time I saw it, I wanted to pick it up and play it. Yeah. And that improves you. So there is, Absolutely. there is something to like the aesthetic and the superficial part of any piece of equipment, I think especially for men, because men are more techy. Yeah. Generally, and women generally, I know I'm going to get fucking hate mail for this, but generally are better with people. Um, men are more about things. I think that's why generally like gadget shops are just full of yeah, guys sure. looking to waste some of their paycheck mm. on something. Um, it's, it's always good to have a reason to want to pick the thing up. Yeah. Whatever it is. Yeah, of course. With regard to sort of saying that the camera doesn't matter. I think one of the things I would say about you is that I found you when you were working with the 5D Mark III, I would assume, and the, the 5D Classic. And I wouldn't have known from which any any photo that I was a fan of was taken. So obviously the fact that you've switched cameras, that's not going to be the thing that's going to draw people into you. But if it's going to elevate your experience and your enjoyment of it and push sort of the way that you work. And I do think as well, the camera you use changes your mannerism. Um, maybe maybe your interaction with people is slightly mm. different. I, with the Fuji, I was much closer to people I noticed at weddings yeah, because it was a much more quiet camera visually. It wasn't you know, a very obvious camera. I, I could do a lot more quiet stuff with Canon before that. I was a lot more reserved. And now with the Sony and these ridiculous lenses that are like 15 times too big, I'm going to have to see how that plays out in my personality. Yeah. No, I, I, I'd agree with that. I think when I, you know, for, for the weddings that I shoot, I, w- I mean, the lens that I shoot nine out of 10 pictures on is the, I've got a, a 70 to 200 L. Um, and it's, you know, it's absolutely massive and it's white and it's extremely obvious. Yeah. And it look I think to, you know, to people that don't really give a second, uh, a second thought about cameras, it, it probably makes you look like a, a kind of pap yeah. or a news photographer, uh, uh, sorry, um, a sports photographer or something like that. And so when, I mean, one of, one of my pet hates with shooting weddings actually is that when you are trying to shoot the moment pictures you know the kind of cocktail hour after the ceremony and you're you know you're sort of walking around attempting to be stealthy with this absolutely massive camera with a two foot lens on it and people can see you and they and they turn their back on you because they don't because it's it is highly intrusive and part of me kind of thinks um oh come on just be a good sport for your host who's invited you here at great 
personal expense. Please just let me take your photo so that, you know, yeah. they have nice moment pictures. And part of me thinks actually it is highly intrusive to have like a two foot lens. Um, yeah, I th- but out of context it is. I think in mm. context, you know, bite the bullet. Yeah, I mean that. That's, keep having a drink, keep having a chat and let me take a picture. That is ex- that's instinctively. The expectation at a wedding is that someone's taking your bloody picture. Yeah, that's instinctively what I think. Yeah. But um, but you're right with with small cameras and with, um, you know, if you do things like street photography or um, something else where you need stealth, then of course the tiny black cameras do. Yeah, I'm, I've never had a... I had one negative comment about the Fuji in all in the I don't know twenty five weddings I did with it, and obviously I took trips to Vegas and Washington and New York and did street photography in London. I had one negative comment overall, which was uh, a registrar asking me um, basically if I was just starting out because I had a small camera, um, which was That's like fair enough, yeah. Yeah, just maybe not in front of the bride and groom. Yeah. It's a kind of a, an unsettling thing oh, to no, hear. Oh, no, I see. Yeah, yeah. right. Um, um, no, I meant fair <laughs> enough from the point of that's um, that's that's pretty positive overall, I would say. Yeah, and everything else was either people that thought it was film, which was I always found quite sweet, or people that were like, that's a really nice camera. What does it do that's special? Mm. Like, does it does it do a trick because it looks old and vintage you yeah. know what, what's the deal with it and it's like it's a camera mm. it just you know you like the look of it yeah the the look of those cameras is quite seductive though i have to say yeah absolutely like with the um with the the little x pro one that i i mean i i, I sold a 1ds mark ii so an absolute monster of a camera that i'd had as a kind of um, a sort of backup body for weddings and that kind of thing. And it wasn't, you know, it was hardly getting any use. I mean, they're great cameras. Um, you know, they do their job and they're fine. But anybody that knows those those cameras knows that they're, I mean, they're built like a tank. They weigh about, I don't know, two kilos with a mm. lens on. It's mental. And it's not what, it's not a kind of fun thing to use. So anyway, I got rid of it and I bought an X-Pro1 um, with, uh, with the money. And it's like, with an X-Pro1, it's kind of, it just feels, it just feels kind of cool because it looks so nice. The yeah. ergonomics of the machine itself and uh, are great. And and just, I mean, I, I'm fully aware that having kind of come on and said, oh, I'm not a kind of gear person. All I've done <laughs> is talk about gear. Well, it's my fault. Um, it's my fault. It's for definite. But it is, I mean, you, you do- did come here though with the fear that I was going to make you talk yeah, about gear. Yeah, yeah. So, I've kind of, I've got in your head, I think. Yeah. But I mean, with the X-Pro1, it's just like shooting. I mean, it feels like a, a little rangefinder. It's like, a, it's fun. It's kind of aesthetically pleasing. It's, you know, it's all black and whatever, you know, whatever technical shortcomings the cameras have, you can kind of put up with that because there's a, there's something else. Yeah. There, there's the vibe, which is, um, <sighs> eye roll, um, you know, the, the kind of aesthetic reasons, the, the kind of soft reason, if you like, it just makes the process a bit nicer. I and- want to actually defend my position on the word vibe. I want to explain <laughs> it. So uh, it's a quote, uh, a friend of mine who says this a lot. We live in a society. Indeed. Um, and there's, there's a, an abundance of people that measure their sort of worth to humanity based on followings which I always find very mm. biblical. Um, and okay, that's, you know, if that's what you're into, then that's fine. The one thing I find funny about the word vibe and like these like positivity things in society now is that it's always the people with an abundance of strangers that are sexually attracted to them that are posting these like self um, referential, I am worth it. I can do, you know, I, I can I can do. And so can you, let's all lift each other up. And it's always just quite funny because it's, it just feels like someone at the top of the mountain that's always referencing themselves as if they're like the, the downtrodden. There's, there's something weird about it. And the word vibe, I don't know. It goes along with that book. Do you know the book, the secret? I've heard of it. but So basically it's like a, I, I read the cliff notes on Buddhism. Therefore I know everything about Buddhism okay. way of looking at like, if you're kind to the universe, the universe will be kind to you kind okay. of nonsense. And um, that if you throw one negative scenario that involves children, all of a sudden the book makes no sense. Okay. Um, and I actually, funnily enough, a few years ago, I had, uh, I did a little bit of retouching on the side for people doing portraiture mm-hmm. and I was tragically bad at it, but people wanted to pay me. 
I, you know, I don't look a gift horse in the mouth. And there was one guy who would frequently send me images. I would edit them and then it would be an absolute nightmare to get money out of him. Now he couldn't have the images until I had the money, mm-hmm. but to be honest with you, the images were of no use to me. So I would spend ages chasing him and chasing him and chasing him. And then this one time he said to me, have you ever read the book, The Secret? And I was like, no. And he's like, well, you know, it will make you realize that, you know, chasing money is not all that's important. It's like, that's oh, great, but can you just pay the fucking invoice? That's, that's convenient for him, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. When he's the one paying the money, all of a sudden the money's not the most important thing. Um, anyway, that's my anger at the word vibe. So I want to sort of quickly talk about your workshops in general. I've booked onto another one too. I've booked onto another two. I'm coming tomorrow, if my week makes sense. Mm-hmm. Um, so in a non-selling kind of way, because um, just for the sake of transparency, in case anyone thinks there's anything mm-hmm. nefarious, I pay full price for everything. I'm not doing it, not like I'm, you know, like phoning you up and asking for like a mate's rate or anything stupid <laughs> like that. Um, I come along as a fan of your work. We've met twice. Mm-hmm. So there's nothing nefarious here. Just talk me through why you got into doing workshops and, and what you get from them. Well, there are... Um several layers there. So first of all, the, at the purely practical level, it's a, it's an income stream. So I think for anybody that does um, a creative job of any description, um, there, aside from very few people, um, training people or teaching people or running events is, um, is a good way to, you know, to, to, to kind of earn an income. And I think especially for People who, I mean, I was going to say, you know, people from their thirties upwards who are not, you know, once you've kind of got yourself a little bit established, you have a career, you have a kind of income and you have the kind of, uh, the material things you need, then there is the kind of so-called, um, experience economy. So people want to kind of do things, um, and they want to do things with somebody who, um, you know, can show them how to do them or is, you know, a a so-called expert or whatever. So there's that reason. Um, I love to teach as well. So I have a, you know, a, a, a background in teaching. Um, and I, I mean, yeah, I mean, I straight up love to do that. Um, also the social aspect. So loads of the, uh, the work in photography is, is working by yourself. And we, you know, I like my own company and I like, um, retouching e- endless photos and that kind of thing, but you can go a bit stir crazy doing it. And so, um, it's really nice to, to kind of have the social aspect. Um, it does from a, a kind of creative point of view as well. I'm kind of constantly thinking, um, you know, I use the images from the, from the workshops to, pr- to promote myself and to prom- prom- promote my work and to promote other workshops. And so I'm constantly thinking, um, other pick are my, shooting pictures, which are the best kind of pictures that I can shoot. Am I working at the peak of my, um, my ability? And, you know, to be perfectly honest with you, I, I think I am most of the time, you know, sometimes you have an off day and you shoot a set, which you think, you know, it's just a bit rubbish for whatever reason. Um, but it, it, you know, I'm, I'm sort of constantly challenging myself to, to, to produce good work. I mean, uh, within the constraints that I have, the size of my studio with the equipment that I have with the, you know, the people that I book to come on the workshops. And so all of those things are, um, limiting factors to, to one degree or another. There was actually, um, one thing that I was, um, I, I don't, I never mean to sound condescending and I don't. I promise you, I don't mean to sound, but in my head, I think I sound condescending when I say this. There was one thing I was massively impressed with on top of just enjoying the workshop overall, but there was a set we did. I think we did four or five sets off the top of my head. Mm -hmm. I can't remember. And there was a set, I think it's the second to last where you weren't entirely satisfied and you were like tweaking and tweaking and tweaking. And you were, you know, you really, what I was impressed by was I, I, you know, I've seen, online tutorials and I've seen, um, I mean, I've, I'm a big fan of what used to be RGG edu, which I think yeah, is yeah. now pro edu. Yeah. Um, and there, there are definitely some of their videos where you can tell the guy is just like, fuck it. That'll do. Yeah. And you did not at any point give the impression that you were like, that'll do that. That gets us past the line. You were like really tweaking minor things that I think a lot of people would look past, which at a workshop is quite admirable because 
you know, there's every opportunity, I think. And I've definitely seen the opportunity when I've done workshops and I've had, I've been moaned at by some attendees because I'm trying to pick apart what I want. Yeah. Um, where you could just say that'll do, it's only a workshop, but you were really like making sure that it was a set that you would want to shoot and exactly how you yeah. wanted it. No, well, well, firstly, thank you. I, I appreciate that. Um, and I think, I, I think in, in that vein, I mean, I, I, I don't want to shoot pictures that I don't really like. I don't want to shoot pictures that I think um, I'm going to have to spend a huge amount of time fixing afterwards. And I think if you can get 90% of the way in the camera, then, you know, that's, that's really good as well. And I think from the, from the point of view of people who come to workshops, who want to see how, um, you know, how a professional photographer works, that is, if, you know, if you, if you, if you're shooting for a client, you, you know, you need to get it right. And so you do, there's tons of, um, preparation work and tweaking. And if you've got a team on set, then obviously somebody else can carry some of the load with that, mm -hmm. but it's just, you know, without sounding like I'm a complete perfectionist or control freak, you know, neither of which I. No, I'd say you were thorough and it's just yeah. rare to see thorough. We, we are very much in an age of kind of that will do, you know, yeah. like if you look at uh, just the like outside of photography, just consumerism in general, we're very, that'll do, you know, we buy, you know, clothing now that's so cheaply made, just, you know, and, you know, places like Primark or wherever mm. that it can be falling to pieces before you get it home. But because yeah. it's so cheap, we're fine with it because that'll do. Yeah. And I think, you know, food wise, I mean, going back to my history working in, in a kitchen and, and, you know, especially like early years of my sort of my early teen years, all the way up to about 20 years old, when I was obsessed with sort of food and what people were happy to consume. And it always mm. astounded me. Yeah. Um, I think that's gotten worse. I think people have just got such a that'll do attitude. And I'm not, I'm not like talking down because I'm pretty bad at the moment for consuming utter shite. Me too. But it's just, it's very refreshing. And it it's something that makes you feel like you've, you know, I, I felt like my money was, was really worth it because it felt like the shot mattered to you. Which is, you know, on a workshop, that's really nice yeah. because <clears throat> at that point you could easily have gone, eh, you know, it's close enough. Yeah. I mean, I try, I try not to do that, to, to, to be honest. I mean, it's just disappointing if you do that, isn't it? And I think if um, there will, you know, there will be people like, as you've just demonstrated, that will notice if you're kind of phoning it in a bit. Mm. Um, and I do, you know, I do appreciate that, uh, you know, going to those kind of workshops is not, you know, it's not like spending 25 quid. It is, you know, it is an investment for people. And so I do, at the back of my mind, I'm thinking, okay, well, if I, you know, if I spend an amount of money going to see somebody to kind of learn something and, or, you know, have an experience or whatever it might be, I want people to kind of feel that at the very least they've got good value, um, yeah. you know, all other things considered. But, um, you know, uh, I just don't want to shoot boring shots or bad shots or, you know, shots with technical shortcomings that, kind of annoy me but even on like on a, on a, a, a like post technical level it was like the feel of the image yeah you wanted to make sure it was one of your images sure yeah i did yeah well thank you but, <laughs> but it's it's quite simple in, in a i mean i remember my first my first studio workshop was an absolute clusterfuck i had a model that asked me the night before if she could knock it on the head and come the next day and right. i had 10 people coming to a studio and okay. it's like well i can't really and she's like, oh, well, I'm at a wedding and I'd quite like to get plastered. And I realized at that point I'd made a pretty horrendous mistake in my selection. Um, and, you know, we live and learn. I was only 28 years old. I was nowhere near old enough to know better. <laughs> and um, uh, she turned up about an hour late on the day. Oh, uh, incredibly rude, incredibly discourteous to uh, the people on there. And I had an attitude towards the end of that day where I was just like, that'll do. Like mm. I've, I've reached my limit of not exploding at someone yeah, um, and trying to look like I'm fine with everything that with the way it's played out and, yeah. you know, seem like there's a positive spin on it. Well, I think you live and learn with things like that, don't you? And yeah. it's not, obviously if you're, if you're, you know, working with someone that is phoning it in, that's a, you know, a huge disappointment and makes your job really hard. Yeah. And it, I mean, it, it and outlines the, um, you know, the importance of working with good people. Yes. And, um, yeah. And I think if you, you know, if you do run workshops and it, you know, portrait workshops, the person that everyone's photographing is, is hugely important, not just the way they look, 
Um, no, no. I think the way the way they interact with you, mm. I've had it. That, so there's there's I, one of my first ever studio days. Like when I was really new to photography, and you just book a couple hours and you go along. Um, there was a model. Uh, who was called Sammy. I'm going to go that far. I, I'm almost tempted to go the full distance, but I'll say Sammy. And um, incredibly rude um, and very demeaning to a new photographer that basically I was thick and because I didn't know the ins and outs of mm. a photographic duck's arse, so I didn't know anything. Yeah. Um, and at the end of the like three hours that I just drudged through, I hated it. Um, she said, um, well, cheers for booking me. If you want to work together, great. If not, sodja. I'm walked off. Wow. Fast forward a couple of years and I'm teaching workshops and she's messaged me saying, oh, how you been? Is there any chance you need a model for your workshops? And that was one of the most satisfying moments of, like, for me, like, to see... Imagine if, you know, I'd have booked her without knowing her and how she is with new photographers and stuff. Mm. It's nice and satisfying to get that side of things and like to almost see what you've learned about someone come to fruition. Yeah. Um, it's a, I, yeah, it's a real shame if people are like that. I mean, I, I think most people are in our industry are not like that. No. Um, fortunately. And, you know. The, I've made a habit of finding them though. Yeah. Okay. I found I've made a habit of finding the bad ones. Every time okay. I talk to people, they're like, God, you've had a really crazy set. And I'm like, is this not normal for everybody? And I've realized that maybe I've, I've made a really good job of finding the nutters. <laughs> well, at least, you know, I think it's to do with my last name. I, whenever I was a kid and we'd go on holiday, the, the nutter in every country would find my dad almost instantly. So I think it's just a, a, a fairer thing. What kind of name is that? German. German, okay, that yeah. makes that makes sense. It kind of sounds Germanic. Yeah, so it's um it's actually kind of a, an inside thing. Um, I often reference myself being half German. I'm not. Uh, it goes back on my dad's side a few generations, okay. but uh, because of growing up in a school that obviously now it's a lot more multicultural, and you know, I I left school 15 years ago, <clears throat> and everybody at my school was called like. Smith, Hawkins, mm. Jones, and then there's Faber. And with the exception of like an influx of South Korean students that came in from a nearby town, I was like the foreign kid okay, to an extent. Yeah. And so I just went with it. Like I just lent in on it, you know, rather than constantly have to explain the name with like the long story of like, well, you know, the last royal mayor of Westhoffen was my great, 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 great granddad. And, you know, <laughs> he was chased out by the French and eventually ended up in Gloucester. You know, that's a long story. I'd yeah. rather just go, I'm half German. Yeah. Okay. And then people just instantly drop it. It's It's been a godsend. But it's quite funny as well when I meet people that are German mm -hmm. and someone will go, oh, he's half German. And I'm like, oh, fuck, now I've got to try and carry this through. <laughs> Um, and I found to that extent, I can just say, I understand it better than I speak it. No, fair Works enough. perfectly. Yeah. Cause I kind of do. Yeah, you know, fair enough. A little bit. And, and obviously you're on, uh, loads of watch lists because of your last name. Yeah. So th yeah, this is, I mean, this is something I found out officially when I was, when I was in the States a couple of weeks ago, which was, I mean. I love this story so much. For, 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 for many years. And I mean, uh, you know, basically since I became an adult, which is a long time ago. Um, most times when I've traveled out of the UK, um, I've been subject to, uh, air quotes, air, air quotes extra <laughs> random security checking. And so, um, that's something, um, that I've just kind of accepted. And, um, you know, there, there was a period in my life when I, when I was traveling in and out of the Middle East quite a bit or, or transiting through the Middle East en route to other places. And because of my, um, my Egyptian surname, which is, uh, which is Shukri, um, because my, I don't know, I, I wasn't really quite it sure. It almost what, sounds like it should be sugar. Is it, is it like sugar? No, it's, it's derived from shukran, which is the Arabic word for thank you. Okay. So oh, it's, oh yeah. Okay. Um, and I, you know, I sort of wondered why this happened and I thought, you know, I don't think I look especially Middle Eastern. Um, and so maybe it was the fact that my name uh, doesn't necessarily marry with my appearance. 
um, or you know wh- whatever. I thought there may have been. You weren't like clutching a briefcase while sweating as you yeah, went through. E- exactly. <laughs> and then when I was um, traveling to the to the states, I had I had that same uh, that same experience. Go off to a little side room, get checked at the gate, have all my equipment swabbed, and so on and so on. And um, so this time they stamped my boarding pass with a big red thumb saying checked, you know, a thumbs up kind of thing. I was like, fine, okay. Um, and I photographed the the boarding pass to, sh- to show my wife, ha ha, you know, they've given it a big red thumbs up now. And then um, a few days ago, I was, I Googled why, you know, why does this happen? Why? And it's not just me. Both my brothers have the same, uh, the same treatment. Um, and so I... I found, I mean, there are loads of articles about this and it's, it's no kind of big secret, but I was reading something on the independent. And if you travel to the United States, and I think I'm correct in saying this, uh, there is a certain um, FBI watch list for flying. I've forgotten what the, what the name is, but it, on, on your boarding pass, they stamp four S's. And um, and I can't remember what the four S's stand for, but it's only super, super, super suspicious. Yes, super, super, super suspicious. That's me. That's higher than just super, super suspicious. Exactly. And it's the, the US is the only country that makes a change to the boarding passes to to indicate your presence on this watch list. Right. And so I went back to my photo on my phone that I'd sent my wife because of the red <laughs> thumbs up, and there it was in the corner, four S's. Um, and that, that explains it. So probably forever, every yeah. time I travel, especially to America, you know, I'll be air quotes randomly checked. Yeah. Um, and I, I and I don't know, it's just mental, isn't it? I mean, I, I'd rather people were over secure in yeah. the airport than under secure, yeah, of absolutely. course, but it does, um, you know, it always, it always seems to be lone traveling men or brown men or, you know, not, uh, I believe that there was a real strong xenophobic slash sort of Islamophobic element to it, which I'm not saying I can understand, but obviously given events over the last 20 years, mm-hmm. it's not hard to find why someone would think that way. Sure. If you're, if you're being honest with yourself, mm-hmm. not necessarily agreeing with the mm. idea, but you can see where the idea sure. germinated from. I, I believe that was really strong until I started flying with my wife and she never gets stopped. She's actually half Iraqi. Mm-hmm. She never gets stopped. One time there was a very rude comment from a, um, what do they call them in America? The the customs checking people. Oh, the T- TSA. TSA uh, towards her um, as we went through in San Francisco, but no stopping or anything. Just a really rude comment. Um, but I've been, I got stopped getting off of a plane in Toronto and this, um, incredibly muscly, like almost completely hairless, which was terrifying because he did look like <laughs> a really muscly alien fella come over and he, he's like halted me. He's at halt, which I feel like is a pretty strong word. Halt is different to stop. Yeah. And, um, he asked me what I expected to find in Canada and I panicked and Moose. said, I said mooses. <laughs> and I saw the look of, oh, he's a fucking idiot. Come over his face and let me go. But my wife is just beyond waving at me like, hi, we're in Canada. And I was thinking out of the two of us, how did you come to the conclusion with me? Like surely if this idea of this uh, stereotype that TSAs and other customs officers have, how did you end up with me and not her? And then we had, I had the the really bad incident going to Finland where I made the mistake of getting annoyed with customs. Always a mistake. They took forever to let me through, checking my camera bag, checking me, took an absolute age. And um, in the end I said, come on, who's going to bomb Finland? And that okay. was not a smart thing to say, No, but I am completely free of prostate cancer. Well, that's good to which know. Which is a good it? check. Yeah. Um, but yeah, no, it's... It, I, I don't know. I find it very weird. I mean, like, I don't look at you and instantly think, yeah, hijacker. I look at you and think English guy. Yeah. Like, you know, just a random guy with camera. Yeah. I think what it is, it is, I mean, I don't even know. Like, how would I get into the mind of a 
security expert. But I think if you're, I guess if you're a family man, if you're with your wife and kids or what, you know. Oh, I suppose be. there's like, there's more riding on the safety of the journey. Yeah. I exactly. see. See, I don't, I don't think like you're, you're very clever with this. I mean, stuff. I don't know. So um, you're very shifty. Well. <laughs> <laughs> You've got this all planned out. Um, uh, one thing I, I want to sort of push towards the ending on is uh, you referenced earlier your masterclass. I don't know much about it. Do you want to just talk me through? Sure. So one of the, I think over the last kind of six months, um, which was more or less when we when I was last on, I'm trying to, as well as all of the other things that I'm doing with my work, I'm trying to um, produce more content. I don't know whether I like the word content. No. You know what I mean? So it's, it's up there with vibe. Yeah. So to so produce online, you know, online videos and, um, you know, other stuff that people can kind of, can, they can watch and enjoy. And I'm trying to get my um, YouTube moving a bit more. But in, um, I spent the whole of the month of October producing a kind of online um, masterclass, uh, cinematic and dramatic portraits. And so it, you know, I had to kind of think of, a title for it that, you know, firstly would attract people and try and, um, distill the, the kind of essence of the, of my style of photography. And so, um, that consisted of 12 shoots. It, it's essentially, it explains the way that I work. So w- w- from, uh, planning shoots, um, organizing color, posing, you know, how, how to set up the shoots, the lighting, and, and the majority of the masterclasses is, is the editing which is obviously the most time consuming part of, of any sort of photographic endeavor. And yeah, so that's what it is. It's an online class. So it's like, you know, the kind of thing that RGG produce or, or that type of thing. And I'm, you know, looking to produce more of that. And generally from a, from a kind of purely business point of view, produce more, uh, kind of evergreen stuff that can, that can earn me some money without me, uh, being there. And I, I know it sounds horrendously kind of, I don't know whether it sounds horrendously anything to say that, but just uh, as well as having real world physical uh, jobs and uh, workshops to producing something that, you know, that can I can earn you money when you're on the night out. Yeah, basically. Yeah. yeah just, and so to, to, to do some of that. And so I'm trying to, uh, I mean, one, one of the, 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 the things with it and I, that so kind of makes me procrastinate basically is I hate the idea of seeing and hearing myself in video and audio, which I think is fairly good uh, thing to say an hour into a podcast. I know, which, <laughs> and I, and I think people that do it, it's fairly natural, especially at the beginning. And so I did all of the, I did all of the video editing myself. So I, um, I had a videographer obviously come and shoot, um, shoot all of the actual shoots that I was doing. Mm-hmm. And there are 12 of those in the masterclass. So I worked with, um, four different models and we did 12 different shoots. Uh, and then I had to spend almost a month editing video of myself. Um, and it was, it was a fairly unpleasant experience. Yeah. So, I, you know, I kind of, that was the point I chose to teach myself video editing. I probably should have looked into learning that beforehand. So I'm, I'm now not a midfield general in Final Cut Pro by any means, <laughs> but I'm, um, you know, my video editing is, I think is perfectly acceptable, but yeah. That's the, that's the, that's the, uh, one of the directions that the work is, is going in. And, and, and I think just trying to, um, build a bit of a community around my work an online community around my work, um, and just, you know, just see how that goes really. How much did you find your own, um, pursuit of getting it exactly how you wanted it sort of helped or in sort of infringed the, the putting together the masterclass? Uh, I mean, it, it, it was, I mean, I think it's always helpful for people to kind of see the process, the creative process. And when, um, you know, people see the finished work and, you know, they can either like it or, or, or however they feel about it. But I think the, you know, people who are, uh, you know, people want to learn how to do things. That's why YouTube exists. Yes. Uh, essentially. Cause they want to learn a new skill. Um, and see cats. Yeah. Not the film, just cats. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Um, And so I think part of me, it was nice to kind of do that. I was also, to be perfectly frank with you, uh, it was kind of scary thinking, um, you know, I hope I can kind of get it right while it's being filmed. Yeah. So that I don't look like an idiot. So that, you know, 
you know, that that's frankly it. Yeah. Um, and two, and most of it went right. There were one or two, um, you know, one or two things that didn't quite go as planned. And I, th- and they're all in there, to be honest. I, I, the stuff that I edited out was, um, not where I was making mistakes in the shooting or where, you know, things looked otherwise suboptimal. It was where I got my words wrong or whether I'd said a fact wrong or whether, you know, the mic was switched off or something practical essentially. Yeah. So the, you know, the, the, it, it, everything is in there. I mean, you, you, you can learn how to do everything, but you certainly see, um, where things don't, don't go, um, as planned, I would say. And sadly, you, all the, all the images in the, all of the shoots are there as well. So you can see, you know, how you choose the good ones yeah. effectively. And, and that, and culling shoots is something, I mean, I don't hate doing it by any means, but I'd certainly, um, you know, I always value another pair of eyes because I, you know, I think I instinctively either love everything I do or I hate everything I do. Yeah. And it's quite, you know, I can, from somebody else's shoot, because you're removed from it, um, you you know, it's quite easy to choose the good ones. And so I always find that if I take three images from a set, the one that I like the most is the one that will probably be noticed the least. Yeah. And I find that's really frustrating. But yeah. I'm like, why don't you like that one? That one's the better one. I know. And it's, I mean, it's certainly if you post regularly on, you know, on Instagram or wherever it, wherever else you might be posting, the stuff that I think is going to do well, that I really love, is usually the stuff that doesn't. Yeah. And it's, you know, that's... Instagram's really particular though, because there's like things beyond how you view the photo that actually make something more popular, like certain crops just don't lend themselves to the format and certain um, sort of, uh, not so much crops, but sort of um, orientations of the shot can be quite, imp- like with your work, one of the things that's I think really impressive with your work that probably doesn't lend itself well to Instagram is just the attention to the small details in the shot, mm. which when you're looking at, you know, a thumbnail size thing on a phone, you're not able to appreciate all of those details. Yeah, no, you, you, you're you're absolutely right with that. And I think because I because I do shoot full length as a default, one thing that I've started doing. I mean, I've been a little bit sporadic with my Instagram over the last few weeks. Yeah, you to need be to hurry up and update it. I need to see some stuff. I know. Um, <laughs> to get my not to be my, demanding, to get but... my dog on there or something. Um, but <laughs> hey, one... hey, hey, hey! I put my dog on my Instagram. That's fair, but she is very cute. So it's yeah. fine. No, one thing that I've started <laughs> doing is um, having a sequence of shots. So having the full length shot in there, but the 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 kind of headline shot is usually a crop. Yes. So that people, so head and shoulders, or you know, three quarter length, or cl- yeah, more detail, basically. Yeah. Well, I think that's one of the things I meant referring back to the editorial, or like the zine. Mm. Uh, reference I made earlier was that it would be really cool for you to have the way that you design a set. So for example, um, I'm trying to remember exactly. There was a set that had the red stripes on the left side, camera left. Yeah. Um, so with that set with um, with Nikki, it, it, I'd love to see you set something like that up and then shoot sort of full length, three quarter, half, mm. sh- head and shoulders, and then something in the beauty range yeah. as as a as an editorial yeah. almost to sort of have that scene in detail run through and even do a couple of changes of the model styling, but without the change to the set. Yeah. Things like that. I know no, that that's enough. not to try and tell you how to do what you do. Cause what you do is immense and I'm nowhere near the level, but just something that I'd love to see. Like I'd be, I'd be really fascinated to see. And I think it's something you could do within the framework of what you're already doing on like a test shoot. Yeah. Um, and I don't think anyone would not benefit from it. Sure. Um, especially me, because I'd get <laughs> to see example. it. Yeah. So where can people find your masterclass? So the masterclass is, um, so I sell that on my englishphotoworks.com website, yep. which is the one, um, it's my consumer facing website, the one that sells the workshops and the software and that type of thing. And the beautiful images. Yeah. So it's, it's englishphotoworks.com slash masterclass. Lovely. Hopefully. And it's, it's downloadable. Yeah. So you, um, you become like a member. So the, um, you essentially subscribe to the website and you get access to the page where all of the videos and the downloads and so on are. And that's, it's actually a really nice system. So the, that is handled by a company called member space. And what they do is they, um, so I pay them to, to put up a paywall effectively to one page on the website Mm -hmm. or as many pages as I I want, to be honest. Uh, And so I pay a monthly fee for that. 
and it means that people can. So if you join a site like, um, you know, like RGG or Creative Live or something like that, uh, I mean, obviously my my site is not as it, as uh, expansive as those other ones, but it means that you can have it. You know, you have a membership to the cinematic portraits uh, area yep. and all of the stuff that goes with that, and that's how it works. And I've I've kind of held off with um, downloading all of the stuff on there, the videos. I'm still a bit sort of scared of piracy. Um, so at the moment, it's um, you have to go onto the site to access the, yeah. the the training. I mean, some of the stuff is downloadable, the the Photoshop actions and the you know the image files and that type of thing. But all of the video uh, content is streaming. Yeah, I think we are. You know, it's probably a good idea to kind of give yourself that buffer. Mm. Um, I remember a while back I made a series of videos on editing, and I sold them. Uh, at workshops so it wasn't something i was particularly advertising online mm. and then i saw myself on youtube oh. and i was like well that didn't take very long no like um but i don't know I, I don't i don't see the benefit myself to doing that but people like to pirate stuff they do um so i'm booked on uh another workshop in may you've got i think it's fourth of april you've got poppy mm-hmm um, and you've got two with Mishka in May yep. and one with Zoe. If I'm, I'm actually really yes. good at remembering stuff. You here. are. Yeah. Um, Zoe's one is in May as well. Yeah. So I, I, I would absolutely, from my own point of view, um, implore people that are, um, that have taste and like your work to immediately get on your website and, and look at booking something. Cause I well, think it's you. incredibly worthwhile. Um, and if you can't get to, uh, the workshop because you're either lazy or, not local. Which just crazy. Yeah. Just go for the masterclass then. Um, I, I, d- I definitely recommend it. Um, and I'm actually, uh, speaking from very, very good experience. No, uh, thank sh- you. Shall we, shall we finish this with the story about the Fuji? Which story? My story with the Fuji. Yeah. Are you going to tell it or shall I? <laughs> I, I think, I think it, I, I'll just, I'll just run through it really okay. quickly. I don't think it's, um, it's it's a lot funnier to me than I think anybody else. But you were incredibly kind to offer me the the use of your new medium format Fuji for a few sets um, over the course of the workshop, and I was very very obliging. I made sure I had my own card because I didn't want to put you out at all, and I um, enjoyed very much the use of the camera, um, only to come home and find no images on my card, and I can't quite work out where I've gone wrong but I have no images. So I still have yet to sample these amazing images. Yeah. Well, we'll try again tomorrow and um, just I'm double I'm definitely going to shoot every set with my camera and then maybe with, yeah. yeah. No, that's one of those annoying... I think you might have like a Chris mode set up where like when you lend it out, it just, it just like, mm. it, it like adds a little block. Mm. We'll have to double check tomorrow. But yeah, that's massively annoying. Just, yeah. I, do you know what? It got me through the drive home. So after um, after we did the workshop, I went and sold pretty much the rest of my Fuji stuff to a photographer that was meeting me near you because he was from Gloucester. So it was a, a handy meeting point. And um, I was knackered. I, I just wanted to get home. And yeah. It's about an, about an hour and a half, depending mm-hmm. on traffic. And I was just like, I, I don't care. I've got some cool stuff to edit and I get to look at these Fuji files. It'll be really interesting. And then like, <laughs> I, I got terrible in, now. No, no, and I got in and I just plugged it in and it just, it nothing. And I was like, oh, good. Cool. I'm just going to have a shower. I'm just going to go to bed. <laughs> <laughs> uh, thank you so much for coming down again. Um, it's been amazing. I'm looking forward to tomorrow. And um, uh, last thing I'll say is please do a podcast because I want you to do a podcast. I think it'd be really interesting. Okay. There's not enough interesting photography podcasts. So well, you okay. should do one. Well, it's my pleasure. Thank you for having me.
Oh, oh, oh.